Hi, I'm Bill Wiley. I'm Stephen Dell. And I'm Rob Weinstock. And, and we're, we're the, the co-chief medical, medical editors, editors of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, Surgery today. today. October is Blindness Awareness Month. To complement all the good work that so many organizations are doing to help eradicate and prevent curable blindness, the October issue of CRST features an all-star team of individuals who are helping to spark meaningful change in various developing countries around the world. They share their journeys and describe the impact their services have made not only on the communities they've served, but also in their own practices. Three of these individuals join me today on CRST The Podcast to revisit the powerful experiences they've had. Join me as they share some touching stories of service and describe just how much they've truly learned from operating under pressure. I'm Laura Straub, Editor-in-Chief of CRST. Timothy Page from Oakland Ophthalmology Surgery in Michigan begins our episode by describing the journey of a young boy from Kenya who suffered severe proptosis after falling into a boiling pot of water. As I write this article, my companions and I are flying over the Nubian desert and approaching South Sudan. Looking out the window over the vast sud below, I remember a mission trip down there in 2011 that was beset by civil war, flooded roads, and failed logistics of moving supplies. On this flight today, we are bound for Kenya with an exemplary team of doctors, nurses, students, and laypeople to provide eye care to some of the world's poorest people. I'm a man of faith who felt the calling early in life to serve the poor and Mission work has always been a career priority. This trip marks my 11th in East Africa. I had the pleasure of serving with hundreds of team members, working together to see, on average, a 1,000 patients in three days and perform sight-restoring manual small incision cataract surgery. We don't use phacal emulsification because most patients have grade 6 cataracts with no corneal specialist available to manage pseudophagic bullous keratopathy. We have, however, been able to adapt modern technology to improve outcomes. My favorite hack idea is to connect a capsule guard INA handpiece made by Bosch and Lom stores to a bag of lactated ringer solution and a 10 ml syringe for aspiration instead of a Simcoe cannula for cortical cleanup. This technique reduced our rate of posterior capsule rupture to zero for irrigation and aspiration over 60 consecutive cases. Working in East Africa can present major challenges. For starters, supplies and equipment are not easy to obtain. Instead, supplies are donated by generous companies and then taken one bag at a time by each team member. We carefully distribute the supplies among bags so that if one goes missing in Nairobi, we don't lose all the lens implants or OVDs or any other materials. Our equipment is also donated. I have found that nothing sharpens my skills more than working with microscopes and slit lamps that are older than I am. The optics and parts are not up to the standard to which I've become accustomed, and sometimes we simply don't have the equipment or supplies we need. On one mission, our wet field cautery broke, and our last cautery pen had died. Our Kenyan colleagues showed us how to create a type of Bunsen burner on the back table by punching a hole in the metal cap of a medicine bottle with a screwdriver and then threading packing gauze soaked in acetone into the bottle. Igniting the gauze provided a continuous burn for hours, allowing us to heat a muscle hook and use it to cauterize the conjunctiva. It took a while to get used to having an open flame in the OR, but we don't use any oxygen or even sedation, so the open flame cautery was slightly safer than if we did. But hacks like this one get the job done, and they make us grateful for what we have in the United States. Our power supply has improved significantly over the past decade. I find myself having to finish far fewer cases by flashlight because our generators can power the microscopes during the power outages that frequently occur in rural Kenya. One particularly memorable power outage occurred when a lightning strike rocked the entire clinic with a sonic boom just as I was entering the anterior chamber with a sharp keratome. The challenges of mission work are great, but the rewards are greater. The most memorable occurred five years ago when a young mother traveled by bus and foot from Tanzania to obtain care for her two-year-old son who had fallen head-first into a cooking pot full of boiling liquid in their hut 
six months earlier. A lack of access to care had delayed the initial assessment. The severe third-degree burns had taken off more than 50% of the child's scalp and brow. With no medical treatment whatsoever, he developed an orbital cellulitis with massive proptosis. After hearing that a team of U.S. doctors was in the neighboring country, the mother made the long journey. Unfortunately, the repair was beyond what our team could provide, so we arranged to have the mother and child taken to Nairobi for care, and we moved on to the next patient. After returning to the United States, I contacted our clinic to find out what had happened to the boy. The staff tracked down his mother and learned that the hospital in Nairobi did not admit the boy, but instead sent him home with antibiotics. At first, I thought this information was incorrect, so I asked them to verify, and the story was confirmed. That day, through contacts and global outreach, I found a hospital in Israel that seemed willing to take him. At first, it appeared that the ear, nose, and throat service would admit him, but then they wanted neurosurgery to take the boy. Then neurosurgery said they wanted pediatric ophthalmology to take him. Weeks elapsed without being able to place him there, so I looked to my own hospital in Michigan. I spoke to burn care doctors, neurosurgeons, plastic surgeons, and anesthesiologists. We assembled a team to take care of the boy, and everyone involved agreed not to charge any fees. It was estimated that the boy would require two months of care in the intensive care unit and recovery, and the hospital wanted $400,000 up front before admitting him. I knew this was not a realistic goal, and I gave up on my local hospital. I reached out to doctors at Tenwick Hospital in Bomet, Kenya. They said they could try to save the boy and that it might be achieved at a cost of $5,000. I shared the situation on social media and raised the funds in one day. News reached the mother and transportation was set. The boy underwent a series of successful skin grafts from his thigh that resolved his pain, infection, and proptosis. A year later, I returned to Kenya, and I was finishing a case one day when the staff asked me to come outside. There was Dennis, held in his mother's arms. He was healthy and looked nearly like the accident had never happened. The pair had traveled from Tanzania to thank us and to give me a live chicken, an original gift indeed. As I finish writing this article, our team is in the gathering space of our mission house where they are sharing stories. Tomorrow, we will see hundreds of patients with blindness and eye disease, and we'll work ourselves to the bone. When I get home next Monday and sit down at my femtosecond laser and high-performance FACO machine, I will remember this mission and be grateful for how good I have it in the United States as a citizen and a surgeon. Eric Purdy from Indiana University School of Medicine details how working on humanitarian mission trips can lead to learning unique and creative approaches to surgical intervention. International humanitarian missions can be mutually beneficial experiences. My fellow volunteers and I bring state-of-the-art medical and surgical technologies to help us make diagnoses and treat indigent patients, and we offer education and skills transfer to local physicians and staff. In exchange, we receive the heartfelt gratitude of patients and providers. We gain experience handling some of the most challenging cases of our careers, and encounter unusual and rare conditions that we might never otherwise see. Despite the use of long, detailed checklists, we frequently encounter challenges that require equipment we do not have with us. As a result, we must exercise a high level of creativity. In this situation, we must prioritize patient safety and well-being when developing an approach to the problem, whether it is a simple alternative to facilitate an eye examination, the substitution of non-ophthalmic tools to complete complex surgery, or the combination of several surgical techniques to meet a unique challenge. Even compact tabletop autoclaves can be heavy and challenging to ship to remote mission sites. We therefore have used portable, cassette-based, rapid-cycle autoclaves, such as the Statum 2000, for many years. 
These units are much smaller and lighter than standard autoclaves. They have sterilization cycles as short as six minutes, and the cassette tray holds a FACO handpiece and all instruments required for cataract surgery or instruments for any other anterior segment, glaucoma, strabismus, or oculoplastic procedure. When a large surgical cautery unit is not available, a much smaller one, such as the Surgitron radio frequency unit, can be used. Even a simple handheld battery-powered cautery device, such as a high-temp cautery, can provide cutting and cautery for eyelid surgery. Occasionally, a slit lamp or surgical microscope bulb burns out. If no replacement is available, we have removed the bulb and inserted an LED flashlight, which has provided excellent illumination and allowed us to continue using the slit lamp or microscope for examinations or surgery. Regulations prohibit many medical supplies from being sterilized and reused in the United States. Many of the disposables we use in ophthalmic surgery, however, can be cleaned, irrigated, sterilized, and safely reused three or four times before being discarded. These usually include irrigating cannulas, cystotomes, phaco tips, cataract and paracentesis blades, malugan ring, iris hooks, cautery handpieces, bone burrs, and many more surgical devices and supplies. Some mission projects have excellent surgical microscopes, phaco machines, and all the other equipment typically used for cataract surgery. In remote areas, however, it may not be feasible to bring large, heavy phaco machines, and it may be impossible to obtain enough expensive phaco cassette packs to permit the continuous, ongoing use of these machines. The use of manual small incision cataract surgery, MSICS, can be particularly helpful in this setting. A dozen different MSICS techniques have been described over the years, and I recommend that cataract surgeons master at least a few of these. The MyLoop can be useful for MSICS, as well as for manual nuclear segmentation during various FACO techniques. This handheld device can easily bisect most dense cataracts, allowing the nuclear fragments to be removed through a smaller incision. Even when FACO equipment is available in a mission setting, it occasionally breaks down. When this occurs, cataract surgery may come to a halt unless the surgeon can implement either an extracapsular or MSICS technique. We have taken ophthalmology residents with us on mission projects since 2006. They help with large preoperative patient screening clinics and postoperative examinations, and they assist in surgeries. These experiences can teach residents to think outside the box. For example, one of the University of Cincinnati residents assisting me on a bilateral lateral rectus recession for exotropia in Honduras developed a helpful technique for using traction sutures for the medial rotation of both globes to allow each of us to operate on a lateral rectus muscle simultaneously. The technique requires placing a lateral perilumbal traction suture on each eye, then tying the ends together over the nasal bridge to rotate each globe medially. The broad diversity of surgical techniques used in oculoplastic surgery requires surgeons to have a high level of creativity on mission trips. Various tissue flaps, grafts, or alloplastic implants can be used to achieve excellent results after the reconstruction of large defects for large tumor resection, trauma, burns, or congenital disorders. In some complex cases, it may be necessary to use a combination of several techniques, including myocutaneous, tarsoconjunctival and periosteal flaps, full thickness skin, mucous membrane and dermis fat grafts, orbital or eyelid implants, and or lacrimal tubes. One simple alternative product I began using during oculoplastic surgical teaching projects in Asia is the sterile foam insert that comes inside many ophthalmic suture packets of common materials such as silk, nylon, and polypropylene. These inserts can be cut and trimmed to provide sutured bolsters over antibiotic ointment and telfa dressing, applying pressure over a full thickness skin graft, and to prevent bleeding and hematoma formation under the graft. 
cotton dental rolls have been used as bolsters for years. In my experience, however, the sterile foam insert material is much less likely to adhere to the graft when it is removed or harbor infectious organisms during the early postoperative period. My use of some alternative devices during lacrimal surgery has been due to a lack of surgical tools or products during mission projects. For example, I was frustrated on several missions when I was not able to offer dacryocystorhinostomy and conjunctivodacryocystorhinostomy with Jones tube surgeries because of a lack of surgical air-powered or electric bone drills at many mission sites in developing countries. I therefore took a new small profile battery powered shop drill on several mission trips. A sterilized five millimeter bone burr is inserted into the drill chuck. The nasal and anterior lacrimal crest bone are then carefully thinned with the sterile drill bit. I then change gloves again and complete the surgery. This method has also been used by orthopedic surgeons in mission settings and developing countries. This article describes a few examples of the many alternative surgical devices and techniques that we have employed in medical missions to safely complete surgery when a more creative approach became essential. This creativity has spilled over into my daily practice, providing alternative, fresh approaches to challenging clinical problems. This last individual needs no introduction. Jeffrey C. Tabin from Stanford University and the chairman of the Himalayan Cataract Project describes how partnering with local doctors can improve the quality of eye care and patient access in the developing world. Many people refer to the great work being done by surgeons who travel and take the time to treat patients in the developing world as mission work. I, however, do not like that term, although it is my mission I prefer to think of this rewarding experience as development work. It's not the several thousand surgeries that I've performed in the developing world of which I'm most proud. It's how I've helped to improve the quality of eye care and patients' access to it in some of the poorer places in the world, and the training I've provided to local surgeons and nurses to create a lasting impact on those communities. Development work focuses on training and empowering the local people in addition to performing 300 cataract surgeries in a week in Ethiopia or wherever I am, I always teach local trainees. One trainee from the United States and often as many uh, local trainees and experienced local doctors as possible to perform the procedures themselves. According to the World Health Organization's 2019 report on vision, individuals living in low-income regions underserved populations, and rural communities are disproportionately affected by visual problems. In these areas, the causes of blindness are usually avoidable or treatable, but the solutions simply are not available. For more than 27 years, I've made it my mission through the Himalayan Cataract Project to help as many people who are living with needless blindness as possible. The aim of the Himalayan Cataract Project is twofold to care for the blind, and to establish a sustainable eye care infrastructure by empowering local doctors to provide ophthalmic care through skills transfer and education. The work started in Nepal because of a connection I had to the country from my residency days. Efforts focused on reaching patients where they lived and building a robust system for training Nepalese eye care providers. I worked closely with Sandik Rui, MD, who introduced me to some great young ophthalmologists in the Himalayan region who needed mentoring. The Himalayan Cataract Project expanded slowly, first helping some of the young ophthalmologists with their specialty training and then developing a full training program in Nepal. After spending a year in Nepal, I was fortunate to join forces with the economist Jeffrey Sachs. He contracted with the Himalayan Cataract Project to conduct a survey of economic and human costs of blindness in some of the poorest communities in the world for the United Nations Millennium Villages Project. This project is based on a concept similar to HCP, empowering villagers to transform healthcare in underserved areas, and participants work with governments and other committed stakeholders to provide affordable, science-based solutions to end extreme poverty. By investing in health, food production, education, access to clean water, and essential infrastructure, community-led interventions seek to improve conditions for the world's most destitute communities. Most of these communities currently exist 
on less than a dollar per day. The Himalayan Cataract Project has helped develop efficient means of restoring sight to individuals in these disadvantaged communities. The first Millennium Villages Project Eye Care Intervention took place in Bansaso, a village in the northern Ashanti region of Ghana in July 2007. In 2006, Randy Olson, Randall J. Olson, MD, brought me to the University of Utah, where I was able to devote even more time and energy to development work through the Himalayan Cataract Project and the Moran Eye Center. One of my big incentives for moving to Utah was the chance to work with the late Alan S. Crandall, MD. He was the founder and senior medical director of the John Moran Eye Center's Global Outreach Division. Alan spent time teaching trainees and local ophthalmologists in various countries, including Ghana, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Nepal, India, China, Guatemala, Tonga, Haiti, Micronesia, and Cuba. He also provided regular services on the Navajo Nation. Other members of the Himalayan Cataract Project and I worked alongside Alan to bring the same system of training and development that was successful in the Himalayan region to countries in Africa. During our first collaboration, we helped train some of the talented young ophthalmologists in Ghana. If you are interested in getting involved in development work, my best piece of advice is to think about where you want to go and find ways to cultivate relationships with individuals from that region. Don't travel to Guatemala one year and perform 250 cataract surgeries, and then travel to Togo the next year and do 250 more. Pick one place that you will go back to year after year. Develop partnerships with local doctors who can really benefit from your skills and aim to create sustained change in that community. Find a young local ophthalmologist with whom to partner to improve their ability to diagnose and treat patients. Teach that doctor new diagnostic methods and help upgrade the available biometry, equipment, and operating microscope. Bring this individual to the annual ASCRS or AAO meeting and act as the doctor's international host. Working one-on-one -on -one with an individual doctor with whom you connect can be a valuable experience for you both. One way of meeting surgeons from the developing world who would benefit from mentorship is to attend international meetings, such as the World Ophthalmology Congress, or a regional meeting, such as that of the Asia-Pacific Ophthalmology Society. Volunteer for Project Orbis, or Surgical Eye Expeditions International. If you have a love for a certain country, contact its national eye care organization to inquire about mentorship opportunities. You must take the initiative to develop a personal relationship with a local doctor. Beyond the joy I get from helping to create sustainable eye care infrastructure and empowering local doctors, I've learned many lessons through my work in the developing world. Traveling to a poor country and performing 300 surgeries a week has taught me to think better on my feet. In addition to improving my skill set, the diagnostic and surgical equipment I use at home is often unavailable and sometimes necessary to use completely unfamiliar equipment. The key is to figure out in an instant how to best serve a patient with whatever is on hand and provide the best possible care for every single person. Development work has also taught me how to stay calm in difficult situations and how to think more efficiently. I no longer feel intimidated by the, even the most challenging cases, and that is a lesson learned through years of development work. Training colleagues, treating patients, and helping to establish sustainable eye care in the developing world are both professionally and personally rewarding. Above all else, the focus of development work is on patients. I treat every individual as someone who can benefit from having their sight and life restored. And it is this truth that drives me on. Many more stories of the important work being done by surgeons sharing their time and talents with communities in the developing world are included in CRST's October issue. Log on to crstoday.com now to read more. Thanks for joining us and don't forget to tune in again next month.